our head of the department, Dr. Prabha Shetty, to please give the welcome address. Dr. Prabha Shetty. Thank you, Danas. Good morning and good evening to our uh, speakers and uh, Dr. Belford. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Belford who introduced me to this uh, uh, platform of Libertech and he is being uh, instrumental in, to, in making this event happen. He's the one who connected me to Professor Delma. And I'm very glad that today Dr. Uh, Belford could uh, be present over here so that I could thank him uh, uh, during this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Belford, for all your help and support. Dear all, we all went online last year when the pandemic hit us. And this is the second consecutive year we are having all our classes online. We as teachers are always concerned about our students. Do they have access to devices? Do they have sufficient data? Are they having enough reference and resource material? There isn't much we can do about the first two things, but the third one <clears throat> where we can definitely pitch in, because of the pandemic, students are not able to travel. They are not able to go to their libraries for reference work. Many of them cannot afford the costly ebook subscription. So I think today's webinar is going to be uh, addressing some of these issues which, which we are really concerned about as teachers. Let me just quickly tell you what this webinar is going to be about. This webinar will focus on how faculty and authors can leverage the largest repository of living OER content available today with over 300,000 online pages of content for building customized textbooks. After a general overview of the projects, the participants will learn how to use the OER Remixer to drag and drop existing content into new organizations and learn of the new content modulating editing infrastructure to guide effective legal and ethical remixing of content from different licensing. Sir will also tell us about the new LibreLens application that facilitates intra-page cross-licensing remixing efforts that tracks content origin, authorship, and attributions. Now I request our former head of the department, Dr. Ignat Mendes, to introduce our speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prabha. Uh, a very good morning to our esteemed guest, Dr. Delma, and uh, also to all our colleagues from all over the uh, uh, colleges of uh, India who are participating in this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank the chemistry department for giving me this opportunity for introducing today our eminent speaker on the subject of uh, uh, this webinar. Dr. Delma Larson to our audience. Dr. Delma Larson is a professor in the Department of Chemistry and a biophysics graduate group and the biophysics graduate group in the University of California, Davis, where he is also the inaugural co-chair of the newly charged Aggie Open Steering Committee to promote OER efforts on the campus. Delmer is the founder and also the director of the Libertex project, which is currently the most popular centralized OER platform online and is responsible for over half a billion page views with about 4.5 million yeah, of confirmed student reading. So you can imagine the wide network and the ranging which this particular project encompasses. Without any further hesitation, I would call Dr. Delma for his presentation to do his presentation to you today. Dr. Delma. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, those were beautiful introductions and, and beautiful overview of what we're going to be uh, talking about. Uh, so uh, uh, <clears throat> normally I talk about uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and it is a pleasure to be here, at least virtually, uh, although I certainly would have uh, preferred, given the heat that I'm roasting right now, to be uh, in your area than it is in my area. Um, so <clears throat> um, let me jump uh, directly in into uh, what we're, we're dealing here. So let, is, oh, I need to share my slides. I'm sorry here. 
Okay. Um, is this viewable? Yes, yes we so can. Yes. See. yes. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, <clears throat> uh, let me start with uh, what organizations were responsible in order to support the LibreText project. Uh, and I, I tend to skirt over this quite quickly when I add it to the end. So I put it to the beginning. Uh, so the LibreText project was uh, supported by uh, the support of a handful of organizations, uh, including the US Department of Education, the National Science Foundation, um, and then also in the state of California, uh, the uh, California Education Learning Lab. Um, we've also received funding from individual campuses, including the uh, UC campus, UC Davis Library, uh, the Office of the Provost, uh, and the support from the California uh, State University and their affordable learning solutions and uh, Merlot infrastructure. And it's without their support that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's with their support that uh, is uh, critical in order to be able to bring to you what we're doing. So uh, let's start with the definition of OER because that's the, uh, the acronym we'll be mentioning multiple times during the uh, upcoming couple of hours. There are several working definitions uh, of uh, OER uh, in the, the literature, uh, not in the literature, in the community. Uh, both of them uh, are roughly the same, so I'll just uh, uh, work uh, with the UNESCO definition for this sake here, and that open educational resources are teaching, learning, or research materials that are in the public domain or released with intellectual property licenses that facilitate the free use, adaption, and distribution of resources. Uh, and this is a, is a particularly nice definition, uh, as is the William and Flora Healy Foundation definition, which is uh, nearly identical. And the key point here in order to define when OER is, um, is the fact that it's a teaching resource or educational resource that happens to be openly licensed. Um, uh, and the open license, uh, and I'll talk about that momentarily, gives you the ability in order to take the content uh, the OER content that's constructed uh, and use it in a variety of different purposes as long as you fulfill the requirements that the original author has put on that, uh, that content. Uh, I want to emphasize, uh, and this is a point of contention in the community, that while I say open, I do not use the term free. Uh, so OER doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be freely available, although it says free use right here. When we use the term free here, we're talking about it free as in um, the definition of liberty, the, the freedom of speech uh, sort of approach, not the freedom of cost. So there are commercial ventures out there that do sell OER. Um, uh, the Libre text is not one of them, um, but it, free is not the defining characteristic associated with OER. So just because something is free does not mean it's OER, and just because it's OER does not mean it's necessarily free. Um, so uh, I used in that definition open license. So let's define that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I don't want to give a, too much text here. Uh, this is not quite the way I like to present things. But the key point is that an open license allows content to be free um, uh, and again, not necessarily free from cost, uh, and it means you have the ability in order to use it. Um, uh, and there are multiple examples of uh, open licenses out there. Uh, one of the initial ones was the GNU uh, free document license or, or the uh, GFDL. Um, uh, Creative Commons license is the most popular open licensing available on the internet today. Public domain is technically not a license, but it falls into the general category uh, of uh, OER because you have no limitations in terms of how you use that. And there are a range of other more boutique uh, uh, copyleft licensing, uh, so individual licensings that are meant to get the same point across but are not formalized uh, in order to do that thing. So the key point, and this is exceedingly important or emphasizes for anyone who's interested in getting into OER, is that except for the public domain content, authors do not relinquish the ownership of the OER content uh, when they put an open license on it. What they essentially do by putting an open license on the content is they establish a set of requirements and allowed permissions for the use of that content by other people. So as long as you fulfill the requirements and you use it within the allowable permissions of the license, then you're allowed to do whatever you want with it. Uh, uh, and uh, Creative Commons licensing is unrevocable. So once you've implemented that onto the content, you can be guaranteed that no one can remove it specifically the owner, uh, in order to uh, change the permissions off. And it gives you the utility in order to continue on and move forward with that. And there are several different examples of uh, permissions that one may want in order to be able to do these things. So what define OER, define open licensing as a 
critical component of OER. Um, so then I want to talk about what are the sort of permissions uh, that one expects in order to have OER or to use OER effectively. There is um, uh, David Wiley, uh, who's one of the founders of, uh, of the OER community, several decades ago formulated the five R's. Uh, and the five R's is what I view as the constitution of OER or the characteristics associated with content if you're going to be calling it uh, um, OER. Uh, so it's the right to retain content, it's the right to reuse content, the right to revise content, the right to remix content, and the right to redistribute content. And I'll use those terms uh, uh, on and off during the, the rest of these uh, the rest of this uh, presentation. Um, and the definitions are relatively straightforward in terms of retain and reuse and revise. Uh, remix is a concept uh, that many people are not, uh, or at least a term that many people are not so familiar with um, uh, out there. And it basically gives you the ability in order to take content from different OER sources and basically intercalate them into a new product a new vision, and that's remixing. Um, and the ability to remix effectively is a key component of the Lubrifix project. Uh, and then the ability to redistribute is just distribution uh, of the content uh, that, that you have constructed or revised that's up here. These are the five R's and these are the constitution, uh, or uh, in America, I call it the Bill of Rights associated with the um, uh, with OER. So let's talk about a little bit of motivation behind uh, why uh, what OER is useful for addressing. Um, <clears throat> so this is the cost of textbooks uh, tracked in the United States uh, by the US Bureau of uh, Labor Statistics since 1980. Uh, so at that point there is locked together. What's in the orange is the general uh, 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 cost uh, index. I forgot what P stands for, price index. Uh, and it basically gives you a relationship with the general inflation that we have uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, and what's in purple is the cost of textbooks, uh, uh, again, normalized in 1980. And what you can see here is that the general growth of the cost of textbooks is about three times higher slope uh, than, the, uh, than the general inflation out there up until a plateau that happens around 200 uh, in 2015, so about five years ago when it happened. This essentially was a bubble and the bubble needed to burst and that's what happened right here. Uh, and there's even a little bit of tail down off of here that's associated in part to the growth of OER, uh, but I think it's also associated with a handful of other things that have a significant impact on the overall cost of textbooks. The key point here is that the cost of textbooks are increasing increasing rapidly and any student uh, nowadays understands that uh, uh, quite clearly. Um, in, in the States, that's roughly estimated somewhere on the order of thirteen hundred dollars, uh, in order to be able to uh, purchase books new uh, for uh, classes. <clears throat> now, uh, this is only a factor or an issue for academics because the cost of the textbooks are getting so high that students are oftentimes not purchasing the textbook. So this was a study that came out of the Florida virtual campus uh, about five years ago and identified at least two thirds of students have admitted that they have not purchased a required textbook in their class due to the cost of the textbook. <clears throat> and that had a, a range of implications associated with their performance in the class. For example, uh, close to 50% of students then take fewer classes. Uh, many of the students will select the classes based on the cost of the textbooks uh, that are available. They, the number of um, students that dropped, withdrew, or failed the class uh, increased uh, uh, or, uh, by 25%. Uh, and many students, uh, one third, have uh, believed that their poor grade was a direct consequence that they were unable to address the textbook. So while the cost of the textbook is not an issue that has a strong uh, motivational factor for me by itself. It has a motivational factor because it's impinging on my academic mission because students are not purchasing it in the order that we want and we want them to have access to the textbooks and more importantly, the material in the textbooks in order to do well in the class. Uh, and that does impact greatly uh, uh, off of there. Um, so uh, <clears throat> that's something we want to address. There's another aspect associated with the conventional situation that we have with textbooks in that the, the basic mechanism of a textbook is a uh, take it or leave it sort of approach. Uh, you oftentimes have a selection of textbooks for a specific class. You pick the textbook that best suits your class or is the least evil uh, in terms of all the issues associated with it. Uh, and under most circumstances, that book is not the ideal book that you want 
for that class, either because of the pedagogy that wasn't supposed to change, either either associated with the pedagogy or associated with the um, uh, uh, with the nature of the students, um, uh, or you want to reflect a variety of different things. So it, <clears throat> if you uh, take a look at a Babson survey uh, uh, that came out of a, uh, I think about 20,000 faculty regarding usage of textbooks, uh, again, a few years ago. Uh, so two thirds of faculty identify that they have to skip sections of the textbook in order to address what they're doing or teach in different orders, or they have to supplement they have to supplement their material with additional content, replace with other sources, correct inaccuracies of the textbooks, or edit the textbooks and write your These are all uh, uh, negative aspects associated with using the conventional book on the uh, case area, and things that we would like to be able to avoid. And OER has the ability to not just address the cost issue, but it also has the ability to address this issue. Um, it gives you the ability in order to customize books to address course objectives, faculty objectives. You can introduce human, humanized approaches uh, for uh, uh, increasing a greater engagement, introduce culturally responsive pedagogy, uh, which is the term in the States in order to bring in a greater reflection of student identity based off their culture, uh, or update uh, to changing times that are not reflected in the textbook, civil unrest, rapidly evolving political changes, which the United States suffered through for the last four years, pandemics, the technologies that were meant in order to address pandemics or a wide range of other things. These are all topics that we want to be able to make sure that our resources reflects uh, accurately. And open textbooks, OER textbooks, are solutions to these problems, um, in part because they can be free, as in free from cost, uh, and I believe it should be free from cost, although that's not the formal definition. They provide the ability for uh, uh, instructors to customize uh, and build the content that they want in order to address the appropriate course objectives, uh, and then to address uh, various examples that are oftentimes dropped from uh, courses or textbooks that are not reflected very well. For example, your students would have a greater engagement with um, uh, with your textbook material if there was a greater reflection of Indian culture or Indian scientists in the book in order to bring in. And the same thing happens uh, for other cultures uh, reflected in, in America, other sexes, genders, and other things like that. If you can humanize the content of the book, you can increase the engagement of students in the book. And any increase in engagement uh, with the students and the book content then corresponds to an increase of internalization of the content that you want to be able to address. And OER gives you the ability in being able to, to do that. I already mentioned the five R's, so I'm going to skip over that. Um, so let's assume that I have convinced you that there's a, a reason for OER to exist. There are issues that OER can actually address uh, and that it's important in order to be able to pursue OER. Um, so where do we begin uh, off of here? So the first thing I want to mention here is getting back to this open license uh, uh, that's here. So <clears throat> I mentioned that there are three types of open licensing available for the content that we have. Uh, we have public domain. Uh, so anything that was generated uh, in the 20s and earlier are by definition in, in the US um, in, in the open domain, uh, sorry, the public domain. So you have the ability in order to use uh, with complete freedom. Um, we also have content from the GNU uh, General Public License. This was the license that originally uh, was invoked on Wikipedia uh, before about 12, 13 years ago, it flipped over to the Creative Commons license because it gave a, great, a, a little bit greater power and utility off of that. And there's a range of sub licenses that fall in uh, into the category off of here. <clears throat> the key point is that when we get content that's OER, whether it happens to be on the LibreText project itself or somewhere else, we have to look at the license and ask what can we actually do with that? And what do we want to do that may or may not conflict with the license permissions? So for example, this license right here is a Creative Commons by license. That means that the content that has this license onto it, you have the ability to use it in any way that you want, but you have to attribute that author every single time that you use it. Now, you don't have to be overt in the way you attribute it, but you do have to attribute it in some way or another. In contrast, uh, you have something like this thing, which is by clause, which means you have to attribute an NC. NC stands for non-commercial, and that basically means that you can use this content as long as you attribute it and you don't make a profit off of it. That's a simplified way. There's more formal definition behind uh, with the NC clause, um, uh, but that is an example of other of certain clauses. There are other clauses like non-derivative, uh, 
which means that you can't even edit it. So anything that has the ND clause on it isn't by definition of the five R's that I showed you before OER, but you have the ability to use it uh, in your classrooms effectively. Uh, so it does have the utility in order to be able to do that. The key point here, again, I, I want to reinforce that, um, and the, you know, the general public licensing has the same issue, is that we don't, just because we have OER does not mean that we own it. We have to, again, follow through with the appropriate permissions and requirements that the specific license of that content uh, provides. Um, so actually, I want to skip over this because these are uh, basically the issues I talked about here. These are the four concepts or four aspects associated with the Creative Commons license that we what we pay attention to when we use it. The ability to, uh, the, the requirement to attribute it. The ability to share alike means that you can't change the license if you have this on here. Non-commercial means that you um, can't make a profit. And no derivatives means that you can uh, you cannot edit it um, off of it. So, <clears throat> fine. So, uh, I've hashed over what OER constitutes, uh, open licensing in general. So let's talk about the OER universe or the OER ecosystem of content that's uh, out there. Um, so OER can be stored in a variety of places. In fact, it is stored in a variety of different places. And there are, uh, and when you go to those places uh, or repositories, you're able to find the content. For example, the open textbook library is a big referatory which means it has a bunch of links to other content somewhere else uh, of that's able to store uh, OER. You could find also referatory capabilities in OER Commons. OpenStax has textbooks that they have provided. Merlot, Open SUNY, Galileo, Open Oregon, Nova, BC Campus, eCampus Ontario, OER uh, Alberta, um, uh, Sailor Foundation, uh, Hawaii, uh, the California State University, Oregon State. Um, and uh, I can't remember off the top of my head the Indian uh, versions. There are a few other Indian uh, repositories uh, that host OER, uh, but you have to be very careful in order to tease out what is valid OER versus what is uh, uh, infringing uh, copyright uh, material that you shouldn't be touching within an OER infrastructure. Um, so this is this basically means that there's lots of content stored in a lot of different places, uh, and this is just in the states. It's like and in some places in Canada, it's like this across uh, the the globe. There's lots of really good content stored in a variety of different places that would constitute OER. The problem that we have is that it's hard to find that content. Um, uh, so. Uh, what we have done with the LibreText project is to try to act as a warehouse to bring as much OER content into the central repository with a single standard in order for people to use. So our guiding mission is essentially this simple sentence. We're implementing a community-built OER platform that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. Uh, uh, this mission statement uh, it has three uh, words, uh, three of our C words. Uh, it's a community-built project, which means anybody and everybody who wants to get involved uh, is allowed to get involved in order to participate uh, and take advantage of the material or to contribute to the content in order to be able to make it so that uh, other people can benefit from them. Uh, it's an OER platform, which means free or sort of free, and I already mentioned about the different definitions of free. It's comprehensive, which basically means that we have no specific gap. So while I'm a chemist, sorry, no specific field uh, of interest. So while I'm a chemist, uh, and the chemistry library is the most developed of our libraries of OER content because it's the first uh, library that was constructed, we have 14 different libraries cover uh, the whole breadth of academic interests. Uh, moreover, we also uh, are not just uh, expansive horizontally, we're expansive vertically in that we have a K-12 library to, to handle kindergarten all the way up to college, and we've had some graduate level work uh, contributed into here. So we have a very broad scope in what we're doing. Uh, and the reason we can do that is in part because of the growing community that contributes to the content and use it. Uh, we follow a no gap left behind policy, which means that anything that we have uh, that uh, or any gap that we have, we have an interest in order to fill uh, across the board. And there's lots of gaps that we need to 
fulfill in order to be successful in what we do. We also follow a no tech left behind policy, which basically means as emerging technologies that fall into OER or some other open licensing for the appropriate um, uh, code uh, is generated and shared. We go through the effort of taking it, internalizing it within our, our, our project, our platform, uh, and make it so that everyone can capitalize on it, just like we do with the content that we bring in uh, in order to, to share it uh, out there. And lastly, Curation uh, is the term that we use in order to basically mean that the content that we have is not a static uh, repository of content. We have an interest because we're in academics uh, to value not just taking content and distributing it like a publisher, but to also take that content and update it, constantly curate it uh, and move it forward uh, in time and improve that off of there. And that's a key aspect that the LibreText project has versus all those other projects and most of those other projects that I mentioned up there in that we focus not just on a repository and distribution, but also to maintain the content uh, and curate it in order to do so. And we do that because the content is stored on a wiki-based technology, which is uh, ideal for large-scale collaborative efforts. Um, and that is the key aspect behind what we're doing. And that means that the content we have is dynamic, uh, or I refer to it as living, um, the opposite of living would be dead. And that would be, for example, if you had a series of PDFs. Anyone who's ever tried to update a PDF or try to cut and paste from the PDF understands it's really not a very good platform to store content and to reuse it effectively. So I want to mention here that while I sometimes talk fast. I hope I'm not talking too fast right now. Um, I, I, I encourage you to be able to interrupt me if something doesn't make sense or you want a clarification on a specific topic because I very much enjoy a dialogue uh, with the people I talk with uh, uh, instead of just a more formal uh, a presentation from a podium. This is especially the case with uh, these online Zoom meetings because right now I don't see anybody <laughs> uh, that, that's even there. So I presume you're there, uh, but uh, it, it's nice to engage in a discussion. Uh, so please uh, intrude at any time that you want here. Uh, so <clears throat> the Libre Text has, uh, as a platform, following that mission I mentioned before, has three primary focuses. Um, uh, it can be used as a construction platform, and that is where you can build content on the platform in order to be able to um, uh, use it can use it's be it's used as a dissemination platform. Um, so as was mentioned in the introduction, the LibreText project is the most popular OER project on the internet today, based off of traffic, and, and that's because of our vast uh, repository of content that we are curating and updating uh, near constantly uh, that we have here. Um, uh, so it's a very strong dissemination platform. Last fall, at the peak of uh, that uh, of last fall, we uh, were distributing. Uh, close to a million page views a day. We're down to about 700,000 right now um, uh, and such. And lastly, LibreText is a learning platform. Uh, and while the construction platform is facing toward faculty, uh, the learning platform is facing towards students. So it's essentially asking, how can you actually use the, the LibreText as a mechanism in order to help your education? because uh, I firmly believe that you can use technology in order to enhance our educational mission um, uh, significantly um, uh, out there. <clears throat> and then dissemination works on both sides off of there. Um, so there was a question that came in here. When you see open stuff is sort of free, what do you say? Um, uh, so uh, in regard to the question right here from Ramathi, um, the uh, when I say free, uh, I mean free as in uh, freedom of uh, expression, freedom of uh, use. Uh, uh, in Romance languages, we call it liberty, uh, uh, and that's different from gratis, uh, uh, the, the free from cost. Uh, and, and English has both of those mixed together uh, in one word, uh, but other languages uh, separate them. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if if Hindi or any of the other uh, languages that you may more com be also comfortable in uh, does so, but that's a key aspect in order to emphasize. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. If not, please uh, step up. So what faculty use OER? Um, so OER is able to handle uh, a, a, a several different problems uh, of particular importance out there. Um, so this is also from this Babson survey, uh, actually from the 2016 Babson uh, survey. Uh, and what they identified is that there's just not enough OER resources available. 
Uh, so there are subjects that there are not uh, textbooks or other resources that have been created or co uh, or collated in order to be or uh, collected in order to be effective out there. Um, one is it's too hard to find what they need. I showed you all this fragmented infrastructure of content stored in a variety of different places. Uh, as OER grows and more and more people get involved in it, and it's been really beautifully growing in the last handful of years, uh, it's, it becomes even more important in order to have an effective mechanism to store that content and surf that content effectively. The Libre Text Project, I'm going to argue, is an, effect, is, is an ideal way in order to go about doing that. There's no comprehensive catalog of OER resources, which reflects uh, uh, how hard it is to find their need. Uh, and there's a general interest in order to have ancillary materials. So in order to adopt a textbook these days, uh, it means you also want to be able to have access to the ancillary materials in order to use that textbook effectively. So for example, you want to have a set of PowerPoint presentations that, that you can capitalize on in order to be able to use it, uh, a, a set of um, a data a question, a data bank, uh, a homework system uh, in order to effectively uh, grade uh, students uh, homework without having to tie up the individual faculty's uh, interests and such like that. These are all key aspects that uh, hinders the use and expansion of OER. And the LibreText project is designed um, by faculty in order to address these needs. Um, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, and we're really quite happy with the progress that we've been doing off of there. So <clears throat> let's delve into the LibreText project. So the LibreText project uh, is a, 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 a bigger name uh, for uh, the uh, the infrastructure that we've established within the ecosystem of multiple servers in order to be able to pursue those goals that I mentioned to you. We call that thing the Libreverse. Uh, and the key component of the Libreverse are our libraries, the wiki that we use in order to store our content. And that's what most people are comfortable uh, with ascribing to a Libre text because they can find that qualitatively easily uh, on Google. Um, since most or all of you are chemists, uh, you probably can recognize that it's impossible to Google any chemistry term and not have the Libre text come up uh, in your first few uh, uh, first few hits uh, that are out there. But these libraries are constitute an anchor of a greater Libreverse of capabilities in order to address uh, uh, these learning criteria that we want to have. For example, we have the capabilities of a homework, both uh, a summative or formative. Um, ADAPT is our, uh, our homework system that we have been constructing over the last year in order to uh, facilitate that. We have a Jupyter Notebook system, which gives us the ability to embed executable code. So you can have a textbook, uh, uh, for example, if you're teaching, or when I teach my quantum mechanics class, I have a handful of pages that have executable Python code embedded into it that lets students interact with the code uh, and play with it uh, and uh, do particle in the box based uh, issues in order to be able to master it. So if you believe that your students should master coding uh, and understand how programs play a role with their education, embed the, that code directly into the textbook so they can actually engage with it is the way to go about uh, doing that. We have several servers in order to handle JavaScript. Those are technologies that uh, in, uh, empower HTML5, the modern incarnation of uh, the web. We have a, 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 a infrastructure in order to address learning analytics to identify how students interact with the material and use that in order to guide not just evaluate uh, the, the students learning, but use it to guide the construction uh, and updating of OER content, uh, OER textbooks and courses. <coughs> we have a, a bot server, which I'll mo I mention momentarily, which is important in order to help address accessibility issues, which is a topic of extreme importance in the states in order to make sure that everything that we have available is able to be used by uh, disabled students uh, from a range of different disabilities uh, out there. The navigator, I'm not going to talk about. That's a new technology that we're still working on. And then we have a, a set of forums out there in order to facilitate communication in the community that we are uh, bringing together in order to move this uh, forward. So this is um, the, the grand scheme of what the Libreverse uh, constitutes. And people who get involved with the LibreText gets, gets access to this whole infrastructure uh, that we are providing here. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to mention this uh, because it has a context within the homework system that uh, I'll be mentioning momentarily, uh, in that the concept uh, behind how we operate is a concept of what's called abstraction layers, uh, or a slightly modified version of an abstraction layer. So you can imagine a scenario like this, where you have a range of different people, uh, some students, some faculty that are out there, and you have a range of different OER resources in this fragmented ecosystem. Um, there is a, a, a lot, uh, 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 and I can do some simple combinatorics in order to address how many, a lot of different interactions that are possible uh, in order to get different faculty and different students and different resources. This is complicated, uh, and this is one of the reasons behind those issues I showed you with the Babson uh, study, uh, because you, you can easily miss various content out there. What we do um, uh, with uh, the system is to gen generate a de facto abstraction layer where all the content uh, uh, that uh, the OER that's out there in the ecosystem gets brought into this thing uh, and becomes a centralized repository or centralized warehouse and then students know where to go and faculty know where to go in order to find the content. That is our ultimate goal. Um, uh, and we are fortunately not uh, uh, not there of absorbing everything in the OER universe into our infrastructure. Uh, and the reason that's fortunate is because there's always a constant growth of OER uh, stuff out there. However, we have a large team of about 100 plus undergraduate students that are working uh, in order to be able to bring content into our system so we can store it and curate it, like I mentioned before, so that everyone can access it right here. And this is the underlying reason why the LibreText project is as successful as it has in terms of um, visitor traffic and, and usage. Um, so here is a snapshot of our activity. This is a little bit older. Um, so we are about two thirds of a billion page views uh, since we started 13 years ago. Um, and the correct number, and I just saw it this morning, is at 5.1 uh, millennia of confirmed reading uh, that we can identify from students. We have a third of a million uh, pages of OER content. Some of them are copies, uh, but most of them is not. Uh, we have a range of assessments that are part of the homework system, and we have somewhere in the order of 1,400 textbooks stored in our system right now, uh, and about uh, 70 that are under construction or under harvesting right now uh, that are not openly uh, available. Those books are separated in two categories. Uh, one are books that are in our OER um, central repository, and the other one are in customized books. Uh, so that's basically gives faculty in individual campuses the ability to construct their own campus shell or, or campus bookshelf that they can store their own customized books. Uh, and we provide that freely available for everyone uh, that's out there. Uh, uh, and right now we have someone who order 300 of these campus hubs uh, that are there. But you'll also notice, and this is interesting, uh, looking at our page views uh, uh, per month, and what you can see uh, is a massive growth that happened this uh, past academic year in, in the states. And the reason for that was this massive shift to online education, uh, like what was mentioning uh, earlier on, that uh, came up. If you look at accumulated traffic, you can see that you get somewhere in the order, or what would be at 660 or six, uh, 660,000, 660 million page views. At our current traffic, we expect to get to a billion page views by the end of next year. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, I'm almost done with the big picture philosophical arguments of what we do and why we do it. And I'll start getting into the nitty gritty details, but it's important to think in order to emphasize what we are doing and why we are doing it rather than jumping straight into the details behind it. Uh, it's clear that we're making the textbook of the future, or at least that's the goal that we want to be able to do. And it's clear that the textbook of the future is not the textbook of the past. Um, uh, the textbook of the future is a textbook of engagement and is a textbook of technology uh, that's available. I think that we need to stop viewing textbooks from a perspective of individual silos of information, but start to view it uh, as snippets inside a greater uh, uh, repository of content that's heavily interconnected. Um, and that's the same interconnectedness, that synergy is what we want students to develop by the time they graduate. Uh, so why don't we give them the resources that reflects that interconnectedness uh, rather than individual sources of uh, content out there. So in order to do that, we need to stop thinking about building textbooks and start thinking about building text libraries where snippets of the libraries uh, or it can be uh, uh, packaged up as a textbook, but it exists within the greater scheme of the content that you're constructing. Uh, 
Uh, and that's a key aspect behind our philosophy behind uh, uh, underlying our aspect, such that you can identify content from chemistry that's connected to engineering or connected to, I'm not sure what that logo is meant to, that's our generic logo, biology and, and, and uh, geology and, and such. So we can see this big infrastructure of, of network that we want to cultivate in our students' brains and they can see it reflected in their material uh, that, that's out there. Um, so, okay. <clears throat> so the intent that we have in terms of building or bringing everything together into our uh, labor text platform, this warehouse, uh, it has several goals uh, or several points underlying. One is obviously the ability in order to be effective in distributing the content, like what I was showing you with the abstraction layer. The second one is the ability in order to take the content and do that remixing. Remember that a definition I showed in the five R's before, the ability in order to take content from different sources and combine them together in order to make a new book or a new collection that reflects the, 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 the different parts uh, from different things. That is best facilitated when all the parts that you're mixing together has the same format, has the same style, has the ability in order to just basically put them together. For example, if you are building a, uh, a, a some sort of construction project, you have a range of different resources uh, or, or tech I want to say technologies, uh, formats that you have in order to be able to build this. And I envision this as a, as a child. Um, you have Legos, uh, for example, in order to be able to do it. But you also have Duplos. Uh, you also have Lincoln Logs uh, and a range of other types of technologies that are rector sets if those uh, resonate with you. And content um, that would constitute in each of these formats uh, are conflicted if they try to put together because a rector set doesn't fit with a Lincoln Log. Uh, and if that analogy doesn't make any sense to you, just think of it that they are completely different formats and unable to, uh, to work together. That's what we have right now in the OER infrastructure and academic in general, because if someone gives you content for, that's a PDF that you need to cut and paste and use effectively, and someone gives you a Word document, and someone gives you a handwritten document, someone gives you LaTeX source, or someone gives you XML source. Uh, <clears throat> there's a range of different formats that, that content can be stored in press books and other things like that. And if they're stored in a variety of different formats like this thing, it is difficult uh, in order to be able to piece the pieces together in order to make a new infrastructure. So what we are doing is we're taking all the different OERs that are in different formats, and stripping away the format, getting the, the, the juicy stuff in the center and putting that into our platform. Um, so it's agnostic, or at least uh, of all the original content that's there, it's the wiki-based technology, so it's large-scale collaborative technology in order to facilitate remixing and editing, uh, and it's easy for you to slice and dice. Uh, and it's that effort uh, which is critical in order to be able to construct your own uh, books with limited pain. Uh, and that's the underlying goal that we want to have in order to be able to, uh, to do that. So we're essentially making a big box of Legos. So you can then add them and combine them together, subject to your wishes, your vision, what you feel is appropriate for your course objectives, your students, your department, uh, and your wishes in order to be able to get across. And the bigger that box or that barrel of Legos, the more complex your vision can be when it comes to fruition. Uh, and there is the reason why we bring everything together into a central standard off of there. And that's a painful process in order to go. Fortunately, I have a lot of undergraduate students in order to facilitate this um, in order to do it. So let's get into what the LibreTex project goes through now that I've gone through a half an hour of philosophical overview of why we do what we do and where we go. This is the chemistry library when you go to it. Uh, if you go to chemistry.libretex.chem.libretex.org, it will come to this library right there. Uh, but it's just one uh, of uh, 14 other libraries uh, focusing on a specific field. Chemistry is the most mature, again, because I'm a chemistry faculty member, uh, but we have a biology and engineering and geosciences. We have a library dedicated to uh, Spanish translations of content <coughs> because translations of, uh, of our uh, OER material is actually something I'm particularly interested in. Uh, and I would uh, uh, enjoy a conversation on that if people wanted to discuss that. Uh, medicine, uh, uh, physics, et cetera. Um, so this is where the a third of a million pages are distributed off of here. 
So what you'll notice on this library, which is uh, almost every library that we have uh, in our central hub, uh, has the same four principal components when you look at it at the top. It has the campus bookshelves, it has our central bookshelves or just bookshelves, uh, and we have learning objects. So this, the content that is stored in the bookshelves and the campus bookshelves are collections, books uh, that are, uh, that are pre-made, put together for you to be able to use effectively for uh, your vision. However, I will argue you have the ability to slice and dice it using remixing capabilities in order to build something better, something new. Now, and that is stored in the campus bookshelves. So when we click on this campus bookshelves, we'll show you a range of uh, other campuses that are available. Learning objects are co is content, stored with content that uh, isn't stored together as collections like a book, but basically stored together as repositories. For example, in chemistry, this is where we'd be storing our labs uh, or our worksheets uh, uh, or simulations. Uh, and they're not meant to be consumed like a book, but they are uh, meant to be able to be perused uh, and you pull things out of it as you need uh, appropriately. So these are the three principal components associated with any of the laboratory uh, libraries that we have available. So <clears throat> let's take a look at essential repository. This is the chemistry, sorry, this is the math uh, repository uh, this, uh, of the central uh, bookshelves and it's organized uh, by fields. Um, so we wanna organize our content semantically so we're able to peruse it. Now we can also do searches if we want, uh, but this gives you the ability to say, I'm interested in teaching algebra. And you can click on this and find the algebra. In the chemistry library, we have it uh, broken up into uh, eight different fields, um, organic, inorganic, analytical, physical, um, um, environmental. I can't remember uh, some of the other ones that are there. It gives you the ability to pick and choose them. But you can also, again, find content by searching uh, that's available. Um, this is a snap it, snippet of the uh, campus bookshelves. Uh, and when you go to campus bookshelves, it's not organized by content, it's organized by campus. So for example, College of the Canyons has their books stored in there that are customized uh, and moving forward. Grayson College has it set up there. Uh, Cal State University Chico has it there. And that's what you have available if you decide that you wanna have a campus hub. And this provides a mechanism for students to go in and see what are the books that I, uh, as a student are am interested in order to be able to use for my class or that has been prepared and distributed to, uh, to students. I will mention that the content in the bookshelves is centrally curated by the development team and by uh, multiple curation boards in order to again, update the content and make sure that things are fixed and again, constantly up to date and moving forward. However, the content that's stored in the bookshelves uh, are centrally customized. So we don't get involved in customizing the content. Let me phrase that. We don't get involved in curating the content uh, in here with the exception of handling accessibility requirements in order to make sure that it, it handles the appropriate um, uh, legality that we need to achieve with our aspect. That gives people the ability in order to, in, uh, to build their vision without having to worry about me trampling on what they're doing or any of the other members of the development team uh, that's out there. And lastly, here's the learning objects for the chemistry library. Again, focusing on here, you can find laboratory experiments, demonstrations, exemplars, interaction opportunities, and worksheets. Different libraries will have different sets of uh, uh, categories and their learning objects because different fields have different uh, uh, different aspects, different things that, that fall into their general uh, category of, of things. So <clears throat> um, as far as constructing content is relatively easy in order to uh, construct content. Again, uh, each of a page of every book uh, that's stored in our library is a, um, a website or web page. Uh, and that web page can be easily edited with a uh, what you see is what you get WYSIWYG editor. Uh, that one there is uh, the one that we use is called CK editor. Uh, it's heavily improved from the basic free one that's available, but the CK editor is the most popular um, uh, web editor that's on the internet today. Um, and it's found in a variety of learning management systems. 
for example, Canvas, which is learning management system that we use uh, at UC Davis, um, uh, uses this editor. So if you can edit uh, uh, in your learning management system, uh, you can edit on the Libra text uh, consignment. And this gives you a very simplified uh, interface that looks very similar to uh, a Word or a Google Doc uh, uh, interface uh, that's available. You'll notice on this page right here that I have in the edit mode, you can see that you can actually have blocks, learning objects, uh, some definitions here. We have a, a block here that's our author bar that's required for the attribution requirement that I mentioned that we need for most of our OER content. Uh, so this was contributed by Noba. Here's a, a professor at their site, uh, and here is their, their system. And you'll notice up here in the upper left-hand corner of almost every page, if we've done it properly, is a uh, uh, an image of the icon or sorry, it's an icon associated with the license uh, of that uh, book. Uh, so in this case here, this is CC by uh, NC share alike. Um, and, and that is one of the more popular licenses out there. It's also one of the more restrictive licensing because it has three um, uh, clauses in its, its license. Uh, and that's the basic principles off of, uh, off of what from these sites come in. So again, if you can edit in Canvas or other learning management systems, you can edit on the Libra text uh, relatively easily. However, many people do uh, uh, construct content using um, uh, using uh, internal editors uh, like Word or Google Docs, and then after the fact, they copy and paste into here, which is a perfectly reasonable way in order to go about doing it if they don't want to learn a new editor uh, and move forward. Um, the, the editing gives you the ability in order to uh, introduce text, introduce images, but it also gives you the ability to introduce uh, new uh, learning objects uh, and new components that are important in order to amplify. Some of them uh, would be visualizations. This is an example uh, of this Python script that I use in my quantum mechanics class where students can actually see the Python code right here that I want them to be exposed to. They don't necessarily need to learn how to write it, but they can start to manipulate manipulate it, and then they can run it. Uh, and it's, uh, it becomes a real-time compiler in order to then evaluate this Python. Uh, so it gives you the ability, give the ability to give them access to the code infrastructure that once they get, they're able to, uh, to move forward. Um, and this shows the particle in the box and different uh, orders and probability densities and things like that. Uh, and if you're interested, I can actually give you uh, links to any of these things that I showed you before, uh, or I can share this uh, uh, slide deck with you guys uh, afterwards. There was a question in here from Savita. Uh, can you once again tell uh, the editor that, so the editor that we're using here is called the CK editor. Uh, big C, big K uh, editor, uh, which I typed right here. Um, that you can Google and find lots of examples. It is an open source technology that you can embed as a mechanism in order to edit the content that's on the site. Because this is a web page, uh, the content that's stored on the web page is actually stored in uh, what's called a hypertext markup language, HTML. Um, and if you click on HTML when you actually have an editing account, and I, I don't think I distributed editing accounts uh, to the audience here, um, you can click on it and then you can see the HTML just in case you're comfortable with viewing the underlying HTML instead of this WYSIWYG uh, uh, interface. Um, it's, it's up to you on how you want to go about doing that uh, uh, and how you want to update these things. I do have people who prefer to edit, uh, write in HTML. I don't know why, but they do. Um, uh, another example of uh, sort of uh, additional features that you may want to uh, embed into uh, your textbook is capitalizing on the community-based effort. So because the infrastructure is set up with a variety of different learning objects that you could take and combine into your system, uh, because you can easily grab this with just a single uh, uh, a few uh, swipes and embed it into your textbook, uh, as is, or to be able to edit it. This is an example of a, uh, not just a GIF uh, that was available on Twitter, but the underlying code for that was available. Um, and we were able to grab it uh, and embed it into our octave. So students can then interact directly in this case here with distillation uh, in order to identify you know, various steps or plates associated with the distillation uh, <clears throat> and deal with it mathematically instead of, um, uh, instead of dealing with it um, 
well, obviously mathematically, but, but, but interacting with it directly versus interacting with the equation. And ideally, you could start to expand this and start to do you know, azeotropes or, uh, or other things in order to make something a little bit more realistic. The key point here is that uh, you can capitalize on the greater community. Um, so you don't have to recreate everything from scratch. That's a guiding principle behind how the LibreTex project operates um, at, at every level of what we're doing. I'm sorry, my Zoom crashed on me. Are you guys still there? Yes, we are. Yep. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I assume it was just a moment ago that it went away, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, so I was defining harvest. Harvest is the term that we use in order to talk about taking content and integrating it into our platform. And that process uh, means stripping away uh, uh, native formatting infrastructure and start to use a consistent formatting infrastructure or a standard uh, into our platform. Um, <clears throat> so my students go through this effort uh, uh, and, and my greater development team so that faculty don't need to do this. Uh, so you don't have to cut into late tech or cut into various websites in order to facilitate that, in order to assure that it has the appropriate uh, licensing off of that. Uh, so we have a team of 100 undergraduate students uh, facilitating that effort. Um, in the process of doing that, they also identify cross-referencing in order to show what the content is in the greater uh, picture of stuff. So when you talk about distillation, you can then go to uh, links associated with engineering, so you can see it practically, uh, or going into organic chemistry when you need to do it there, or in physical chemistry if you want to go into the basic principles behind underlying um, the Gibbs relationship associated with those things. Uh, we also apply meta tags in order to be able to make it so that we can uh, effectively catalog the content and cross reference it. So when you do a search on distillation, it will pull up all the pages that are associated with distillation. Uh, uh, and more importantly, it also gives you the ability in order to do an overview. It said, here's your book. What are the meta tags that are connected or uh, correlated with your book? So you can say, are you handling all the learning objects that you need for your overall book? But the key benefit off of this thing is we pre-digest the content so it all has the same format and all has the same standards so that faculty can effectively start to remix the content, just like with the Lego blocks, adding them together in order to be able to make a new vision. In order to facilitate that, because we have a third of a million page views, we introduce a new technology, which we call the OER Remixer, uh, uh, to do that. And the OER Remixer not kind of, okay, the OER remixer, uh, and, and I can show you this in practice um, um, after the presentation over, is a very simplistic GUI interface in order to take it so you can drag content from our library, a third of a million pages on this side, and start to build your own book right here. Uh, so in this case here, if you're building a beginning chemistry book, you can start to drag content over and polish it, change it. We have an auto numbering system in order to sync it up uh, so you can actually start to organize it. And if we formulate the content appropriately when we drag these things over, uh, it will also change all the equation numbers, figure numbers, and table numbers on each of the pages in order to make it effective. Again, the key point here is to make it as easy as possible for faculty to combine the content that's in our repository in order to make new books. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be uh, needing to edit the content, but you can get a lot done effectively in order to be able to use the remixer uh, off of it. <clears throat> I'm going to mention uh, two of our bots. So we have some bots that go through our site in order to update the underlying HTML. And this is part of the importance of curating so we can actually start to fix issues 
uh, for example, when uh, accessibility, uh, for example, uh, has changed its uh, standards and you want to be able to change something like that, you can train a bot in order to go through in order to update it. But it also provides an easy mechanism in order to update uh, for a standard centralized presentation. So the first bot that we have is the Brad bot. The Brad bot is named after Brad Pitt. Uh, and the reason for that is the Brad bot, when it runs over your page, makes your page pretty. Uh, and Brad Pitt is pretty. Um, so therefore, hence uh, why we, um, we named it the Brad bot. The Alley bot, Alley is short for uh, accessibility, uh, where the 11 here is the 11 characters between A and Y. Um, and it's essentially designed in order to take content that's already been prettified by the Brad bot and start to update it for accessibility requirements. Um, so accessibility can oftentimes be a painful process in order to be able to ensure that you are effectively handling things. And the accessibility bot is designed in order to facilitate that. And, and let me phrase that, it's designed in order to handle that uh, as automatically as possible so that the amount of editing necessary by the uh, by the author uh, or the remixer in order to ensure accessibility is handled is minimized. Uh, often. Um, uh, we have started to build a, um, a, uh, a central portal, which gives us the ability in order to do searches. For example, uh, you can do a search on College of the Canyons, uh, and this is a mechanism in order to give that information out to students. So you can see all the books that are associated with College of the Canyons, and they can select different libraries. So they don't have to interface directly to the LibreText book itself in order, LibreText libraries in order to access it, uh, access their books. They can see all their books at a, a glance automatically put together right here. <laughs> um, so we have a variety of dissemination mechanisms uh, in order to get the information, uh, the, the books out, uh, because uh, there are a variety of uh, needs uh, out there for the content that we have available. Um, so one of the first things that we started to address uh, for dissemination outside of uh, having access to the internet uh, is physical text. Uh, so we have coupled with uh, Lulu, um, which is a US-based um, federated infrastructure of uh, real time or just just in time publishing uh, so that we can actually take books and push it to the publisher uh, that's customized for example this is my general chemistry uh, second quarter general chemistry honors uh, book uh, and have it print up and given to me in the fastest i can get it in five days sometimes it takes 10 days depending upon um, the load that's out there uh, and this book here costs about 12 12 american dollars uh, uh, which is pretty cheap uh, it's black and white and it's uh, um, paper bound uh, or soft bound but i can i can get it in hard bound i can get it in color if i'm willing to be able to uh, uh to pay that out of there um as bob mentioned in the chat um <clears throat> there are uh you know activities that are online that uh, don't reflect very well when you actually print it up in paper. For example, if you embedded videos or other interactive material uh, in your online source, like I showed before with the Python code, that obviously is not very useful on a, a paper-based version. However, what we do with videos and what we are about to do with the other visualizations is to generate a QR code uh, that is embedded and on top of the video. So if you have a phone, uh, you can then scan over over it and then see the video or see the interactive material and get that immediately from the book itself um, so that you can at least uh, <clears throat> make it uh, possible in order to have this multimedia experience depending upon uh, physical and stuff like that. There are other repositories or other export options that we have available. Uh, people can download a PDF. They can uh, download the ability uh, the what's called a common cartridge that you can embed into learning management systems. Um, you can again go to a print, get a print copy. You can get the files for the print copy. Later on this summer, we're going to have an EPUB three output, which gives us the ability in order to um, uh, to use it completely offline, but using it ele electronically. Um, <coughs> um, and one thing that we've been pursuing for a while, but we haven't uh, uh, stepped up the game in this uh, field, uh, is what I refer to as LibreText in a box. Uh, and that's basically a Raspberry Pi box, which looks like this. It's relatively small. It's a little mini computer. It costs about 50 uh, US dollars. Uh, you can plug it in and it becomes a hotspot. So we can load this thing up with the entire library. So not just a book, uh, but a third of a billion 
sorry, a third of a million pages uh, and distribute it to areas that have no high speed internet or no internet at all uh, and they're able to actually access it and uh, 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 capitalize on it as long as they have a Wi Fi enabled device uh, to, to work off there. Uh, but obviously, the other mechanisms are available if you have internet uh, intermittent access like the uh, uh, the EPUB or the PDF uh, 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 output that we have available. Um, uh, so I'll be showing the remixer momentarily. It looks like I'm getting a little slow. Um, uh, I I will end with my mission statement and I'll show you a few of the, the things that I talked about uh, uh, in, in a moment. So let me again end uh, with our with what I started with which is our mission statement we are implementing a community built OER platform it's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels and it provides a mechanism for you to be able to capitalize on our content effectively to both remix new content uh, and to use it effectively uh, in your classroom uh, and there's a range of technologies out there so that is the end of my overview. And then I was gonna go into showing you some of the examples of how you can remix and build your own books that are out there. Did we wanna take a few minute break uh, or do we wanna jump straight into it? Uh, so you can take a break in, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, you all can ask, you all can unmute yourself and ask. Raise hands so that we can give you, uh, we can unmute uh, you. Anyone has any questions? So I think you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm logged in here as uh, uh, as myself. Uh, so I see a few more things than what you would normally see uh, uh, when you come in. You can remix and you can use the remixer without a an account. Uh, however, at the last step, when you actually save the remixer to the server, you're unable to do that. What you can do is you can save the remix to a file uh, onto your own computer. So you can actually follow along with almost everything that I'm talking uh, can be talking about now. Uh, and you can request an account by going to register.levertext.org, uh, which I will post here um, online. Uh, if you uh, register. If you go there, you can request an account um, uh, for that. We have to go through some review process before we give the account because we don't give it out to anybody, uh, just anybody. <clears throat> um, and interestingly enough, or ironically enough, one of the reasons for that was back in 2014, uh, when we had uh, everything open, we had a hard time with people storing Bollywood films uh, on our site, presumably from India. Uh, so that's the reason why we had to close it off in order to be able to evaluate these things, because uh, after a couple weeks, we had to um, stop storing Bollywood films, which I presume were um, copyrighted and illegal to store. So anyways, <clears throat> so this is the Libre Text project. Uh, and uh, I, again, I'm signed in here. Uh, when you're not signed in, it's gray. Um, why don't I just do this as if I'm not signed in uh, and then I won't be able to, uh, to sub submit that. Actually, uh, and I'll do the first step here. So if I click on Remixer, so let me, let me go through this thing. So let's take a quick look at the, uh, the central bookshelves. Again, I have these eight different categories I talked about before, uh, and you can peruse these categories and you can take a look if you teach organic chemistry. You have a range of different books of uh, resources that are out there. We have two types of books uh, or collections on here. Uh, if anything that says book on it, uh, in the title, that means that it's a, uh, a novel collection or a new uh, or an OER intrinsic book that's formulated. Uh, for in this case here, Nichols made organic chemistry for uh, lab techniques that's embedded on here. Uh, O'Donnell made organic chemistry nomenclature workbook uh, or how to be successful organic chemistry or other things. You'll also notice that you have this thing that's called map. Uh, and a map is not a book per se, it's actually a book uh, or collection of OER material that's organized around an existing commercial textbook. So in this case here, this is organized around the uh, McMurray's organic chemistry textbook. 
that it is not a copy of the organic chemistry textbook stored on our site because that would be illegal in order to do. However, there is a legal precedence in order to be able to um, uh, capitalize on the organization and the pedagogy uh, of the book that we can then build um, our own version of that book using OER material. Um, and so I have a team of about uh, 10 faculty, 10 to 15 faculty that are working on building um, the complete set of uh, chemistry textbooks uh, for an American Chemical Society bachelor's degree from start to finish. So in other words, you can in America uh, in a year and a half, once we are done with this, be able to get a bachelor's degree uh, with uh, at least for the chemistry section of your bachelor's degree uh, without having to purchase a single textbook. Um, and that includes organic, inorganic, analytical, physical, uh, biological, um, and then general, our, our, our beginning argument. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so we have books and we have maps uh, uh, off of here. So I'm going to be building a, a new book uh, that's out here. When I pull up the remixer again that you get from pressing this button on the, the gray bar, it pulls up the remixer, which is this interface in order to be able to slice and dice the books in order to build your new vision. Now, I will mention that the remixer is only as useful as your vision. So if you don't know entirely what you want to build, um, uh, it will give you garbage uh, or rubbish uh, out there. But if you have a general idea of what you want to do or you formulated your idea before you actually go into here and you say, I want this book to look like this, it can be a lot more effective for you. Um, so I'm going to build a book and I'm going to call it Del Mar's a uh, big chemistry book. <clears throat> um, and uh, that's odd. Hmm. Okay. Um, so the uh, there are two sections that we have right here. Uh, we have the library panel and we have the remix panel. The library panel lets you peruse all the pages uh, on our site that's publicly available. We have things that are uh, uh, under construction or private. Uh, so here are all the, uh, the campus bookshelves uh, that I showed before. Here is the centralized bookshelves and here are the learning objects. Most people focus on the bookshelves, uh, the centrally curated, but you can equally remix from content from other people's books uh, if you decide you like their organization and you wanna come uh, uh, to take it. So uh, here we go. This is uh, this is the uh, this thing here. Uh, on this side here is the book that I'm creating. So it gives me a default, saying it's the default has a front matter and back matter, and it has five chapters. And that's just basically a default that's given to me. I'm going to delete each of these chapters uh, uh, because I really don't want to make anything new. Uh, that's there. <clears throat> now this is a blank book. Um, these things are made automatically just in order to give a context. And let's say I want to make a physical chemistry book. So I'm going to go into the physical chemistry section of uh, the library and I want to find some pages uh, that I like. So I'm going to say I want to find some pages of Macquarie and Simon. Um, and I grab postulates and, uh, and principles of quantum mechanics. That's a chapter and here's a section, a uh, section 4.1, 4.2, 4.3 as you have organized. And I can grab it. Uh, I click uh, my, my mouse and I just bring it over here. And then it comes over and it, it's there. I'm going to delete this. Uh, and I'm going to bring this whole chapter over. That's right there. Um, so what you'll notice when I brought this chapter over, it brought the chapter and all the corresponding sections associated with that chapter uh, all the way over. What you'll also notice because the auto number is on, when this was chapter four in this book, when I put it here, it's the first chapter. So it made it chapter one and it made all the sections associated here with chapter one. So I can grab, let's say chapter six and put it before chapter one here. And then it's gonna restructure that and make that one and make this now chapter two. Uh, this is again, all because I have the enable auto number. If I were to turn it off and do the same, it would not be reflected uh, off of that. Um, so, um, uh, so that's the um, uh, that's the ability in order to do this thing. We can come in and delete uh, uh, these pages um, as you do. Now, everything that's constructed here is just the order that has been put in place, and that right there is stored on my computer. Uh, so at this point, 
I want to be able to save this, which means write this book into my sandbox. A sandbox is given to every person who has editing accounts. Uh, if you go to register.libertakes.org, um, but I'm not logged in with a registered account here. I'm logged in uh, with an anonymous account. So if I were saved a server here, it's going to tell me I can't do it because again, I'm in definition mode. So the best thing I can do is to save to a, uh, a computer and that saves it as a file um, that I can then upload uh, off of here. What this means is that you can build your book uh, constantly and uh, 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 as you want uh, and share the file with other people. You can load the map up uh, and then start to polish and move this thing without having a single account in order to be able to build and do your stuff. However, if you want to actually store the, the book on our site, uh, we need to um, to make that map into a reality. And that means having an instructor account, which I'm going to do right now. So when I log in with an instructor account, that gray bar turns black. Uh, uh, and now it looks a little bit different. Uh, let me pull up that book that I just created. Uh, I'm going to load that map up just to make life a little bit easier. Um, and then you can see that I have the same book that I just created. But now it's loaded in when I'm in the uh, logged in mode instead of not logged in uh, that's out there. So now if I were to save this to the server, uh, it doesn't give me the warning saying access denied. It's essentially giving me an overview of what's going to do it before it you go through it in step two. It's basically making six, three pages that'll be blank pages. It's going to make 13 pages that are copy transcluded, and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, zero that are copy forked, zero that are copy full, and uh, it follows an organizational structure that we expect of a standard book. Um, so I should mention here that uh, the content that's brought in here is copy transcluded. What that means is that the, we're, we're making pages up. When, when I drag and drop this thing here, I'm not just building a copy of the source into here. I'm actually building a page up that transcludes, which means it takes the content from that page and mirrors it on the new pages that are created, but it's not stored there. Now, this may sound kind of weird to you, but you probably have some familiarity with it. This is essentially the same as a shortcut on a PC or an alias on a, uh, an Apple product. Or if you're into Unix, it's a symbolic link. It's something that looks like a file, but it really is not. It goes somewhere else. Think of this as this is something that looks like the contents on the page, but really it's stored somewhere else. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. Let me make this into a reality, this very simple two-chapter book. Uh, and I'm going to save it, uh, and now it's creating it. it. It has to make 21 pages, uh, which takes a few seconds, uh, in this case here, uh, 20 seconds, uh, in order to create uh, and bring the content over uh, and then uh, off of that. So it is almost done. Uh, and you can see what it's writing, what it's doing at the time off of here. It is now done. I can click on this button right here, uh, and I go to this book, Delmar's. A uh, big chemistry book, which consists, which is not terribly big at all because it has only two entries onto it. Uh, if I were to look at the table of contents, I could see them right here. It's exactly what I created using the remixer. If I were to go to, let's say, chapter 1.3, uh, hydrogen uh, atom orbitals depend upon three quantum numbers, uh, it has the content that you would expect for that page that's brought in. But remember, I said this is a copy transcluded page. You cannot tell a copy transcluded page from a normal copy, or what we call a copy fork, uh, the, uh, from just looking at it. Uh, you need to actually try to edit this page. So if I try to edit this page using this button that's now on that bar there, I can then see that there's no content here at all. The content is actually stored somewhere else. It's stored on this page right here. So if I click on that button there, I can go to the source page that's being used. And it's identical to what you saw. But if I were to edit this page, uh, did I press the wrong button? I did because it changed on me. Um, now I can edit it here and have it reflect over here. Now, why do we go about doing this? Well, we do this for several reasons. One of the, the better reasons in order to do that is it provides a mechanism for essentially curating and updating things. 
So most people who create their own remixes do not edit uh, content on every page. Uh, they, they largely use the content that's there and they play a little bit uh, uh, with certain visions that they want to be able to change around. What that means is the database that we have of content can get really big and bloated with multiple copies of the same page. Um, and that's not so ideal. The second one is that when it's centrally curated like this, if I update this page right here, if I improve it in some way or another so that other people can benefit uh, uh, from it, you then, as a uh, as a author of a remix that that has a copy transcode version of it, will benefit from it, uh, and that's the the utility of centrally curating it, so everyone can benefit from updating this thing um, and uh, in a variety of different things. What you'll also notice is that equations are reflected in this text here, which is LaTeX. Um, it's basically a um, uh, uh, or what's called math jacks. So you can actually write equations using math jacks. And then if you take a look at it right here, it comes up with very beautiful, um, the, uh, very beautiful equations that are well rendered. Um, and that's the technology that we have off of here, but it means that in order to make beautiful equations, you need to learn some LaTeX in order to be able to do that. And that's the side effect off of it. There is a benefit from accessibility that this thing is accessible when you actually write it there in order to be able to uh, let you do and uh, uh, and and put it out there. Um, so the uh, uh, I'm trying to look at something that I may want to improve uh, off of here, like like for example, let's say I want to take this thing and I want to uh, bold this. So we are constantly updating our, our pages in order to reflect uh, things that we want to do. So this one here might be what I want to do. So you'll see that I save this. This is the source page, and this is what I saved. So right here, I bolded each of those, uh, those key terms here. This is what was transcluded. It's not reflected, but if I were to uh, press this button, it will automatically get reflected. So that's an example of the propagation that we have available in order to be able to, to do that. Um, the, uh, and then that's it. So what I just did is I generated a new remix, but we oftentimes want to be able to update the remix uh, and continually tweak it around. The remixer is designed only for manipulating pages. It's not designed for editing the content on the page. That's what you need to use the editor directly like the way I showed you before. So let's say I switch to re remix mode, which gives me the ability in order to open a book. Um, and I'm going to uh, go to my sandbox. And this is going to be a little big because uh, I have a lot of sandboxes that I have access to as an instructor. Actually, let's let me kill that and go to Delmar's big book. I'm going to open up the remixer again. Um, and I opened it up in that book. And when I switch to edit remix mode, uh, it automatically pulls up the book, the book that it happens to be in. And that makes it easier in order to find content. So I got this book, but now I'm in edit remix mode. So I have the ability to then say, okay, well, this is the book I want. I really don't want to talk about S orbitals. I want to delete them so I can delete it. Because the auto mixer, the auto number is set up, it will delete that page and then it'll renumber this page to 1.4 because it shifted it around. Or I could take this and I can drag it and reorganize it and it changes the numbering right here. So when you're changing the title, when you actually save this thing, it turns orange. If it's red, it means it's going to be deleted. Um, uh, and I can delete that thing and I can add a new book or a new section on here. So let's say I'm going to add something from general chemistry and I grab something from OpenStax. Uh, let's say I grab the thermochemistry book and I feel the thermochemistry book should be, the thermochemistry chapter should be added to here. So now it's chapter three, but I really don't want calorimetry. So this is a really screwy book uh, out there. Uh, so I'm deleting pages, I'm renaming pages, I'm adding new pages and hence the color code I'm going to save it to server. It gives me the overview of what it's doing right here. Uh, and then I save the page and it's just resaving it. 
So this basically gives you the ability in order to build the book and constantly go back and revise it uh, again with this auto numbering infrastructure that you have in place. The one thing that I'll mention here um, is that while the auto number is set up that you drag and drop, uh, like I men mentioned before, so for example, this ther thermochemistry book used to be chapter six, but now it's changed to chapter three. This page used to be chapter three, uh, six point three. Now it's uh, sorry, six point two. It's now three point two. But all the page numbers, because we have this code, will reflect the actual number up here in the title. So that means that you can conveniently put this thing together in order to be able to process. This is a FET simulation that's embedded into it uh, in order to be able to process it. That is meant in order to make life easy so you can conveniently remix and not have to worry about equation numbers, table numbers, or figure numbers, because those will remap to the actual title of the page itself using this triple number system instead of a traditional uh, double number system. So. There are a few questions that are in the in the chat. Is there something in there that I should be addressing? I think I see Bob answering some of them. Uh, uh, so, uh, is LibreText compatible with R? Uh, compatible with R? Uh, not a math lab. I'm not familiar with MATLAB. Um, it is. Uh, uh, it has Octave, uh, which is a MATLAB uh, alternative that's been around for several decades, uh, which is quite reasonable for most of most of MATLAB stuff. MATLAB, I, I don't know about because I'm not familiar with that uh, system. But we also have um, we have R, we have Octave, we have Sage Math, we have Python, um, and we have C++. Um, I think those are the the principal languages that are part of our Octave, uh, are part of our um, Jupyter Hub uh, instance that you have access to embed uh, out there. Um, so uh, that's the basic principles of remixing. I encourage you to pull open your uh, computer in order to be able to uh, play around with that. If I refresh this thing, that third chapter should show up here, uh, and then it's available. You'll notice that when you actually take a look at here uh, that. Again, you have the license that up here that tells you what the permission is. So you click on here, it tells you what you are allowed to do uh, with that license. This is an attribution of 4.0, uh, which means that you're free to share it, do this stuff here and adapt, remix, conform, but you have to provide the attribution. Uh, and that's what we uh, do uh, when we have uh, our author bar uh, that's, um, that's right here in order to address it. Although we oftentimes have a section down here of contributions and attributions, uh, just as a, a double check in order to be able to ensure that. The pages that we have also has this auto lens or auto attribution, which gives you the ability in order to keep track of content from the original source page. So you can slice and dice content here and it will automatically keep track of the attributions and the license requirements for that page. Um, this has been, uh, this, this will take a few more months for it to mature to be super strong, but it's uh, because it has to uh, update all the pages and it takes a while in order to do that with the appropriate lights, uh, appropriate tagging uh, in order to do that. Rochelle asked, can we remix from different subjects? And the answer is uh, a, a big yes. Um, so uh, for example, let's go back to my book here and say that I feel that this, bio, that this uh, Delmar's big chemistry book really needs something from um, the physics library um, uh, because it's sort of a quantum mechanics like uh, book. So I can go to the business, uh, the physics library, go to uh, quantum mechanics, look in uh, Fowler's quantum mechanics book and say that I feel angular momentum should be added right here and it drags and drops it. Uh, because the auto number is set up here, it rechanges the numbering of, again, the chapter and the section and changes these numbers to account. And then I save to the server. Uh, and then now it's spitting it out. Uh, uh, and, but it's using a cross library uh, remixing. So you're not limited to just the pages on that library. So, um, <clears throat> so that is uh, the general overview of uh, uh, of remixing. Um, it, it's exceedingly powerful when you have the remixer, in part because the content is stored with the same format, 
the same standard of content in the same uh, repository to uh, effectively remix and with the renumbering make it effective in order to make sure that uh, all the numbering is set up right and all the uh, the figures and tables and things like that will also be automatically put in place. That does not mean that you may not necessarily want to edit the content on a page. Like for example, uh, here's a page that I, I have and I want to edit it, let's say. So I try to edit it and then I see that it's copy transcluded. So what do you do? Well, you need to convert it from copy transclude to copy fork. And the way you go about doing that is you look under the options button again everything that i'm talking about is under our construction guide that you have access to under the developers once you log in uh, so under options it has the forker and if you press the forker it essentially takes a page and converts it from copy transclude into copy fork um, so in that case there uh, we reload it and it doesn't look any different than what it was before now, what you may notice is it doesn't have a certain icon that used to be up here nor uh, that was meant in order to indicate that it was a copy transclude page. For example, um, this is the page that's on the other side. This is copy transclude and has that little icon there. That's just convenient for you to take a look at. This is not viewable to anonymous viewers. It's only viewable to editors. Uh, so in this case here, if I try to edit this page, I now have access to the content that's edited in there. So I can say, I really don't think that I want that. Um, I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. Uh, who wants that? Who wants that? Uh, and start to do whatever uh, you want to do. And you save it. Um, and you are now making your vision uh, out there. Now, in this case here, my vision is not overly impressive because I just basically butchered uh, the book, the, the page, but nonetheless, that's the mechanism that you have. When you have a copy transcluded page, you fork it and then you edit it. So the intention of the copy transclude was not to make it more awkward for you guys to be able to edit it. It's just to make it uh, easier in order to effectively transclude and bring it together. Uh, that's there. Um, let me mention uh, one or two other things, and then I want to talk about the homework system, uh, which I think I have another 20 minutes left uh, in, in, this, in this presentation. Um, so the um, uh, actually now I am completely um, uh, messing up here. Uh, there was something that I was going to address, um, uh, but uh, um, again, you can find uh, when you under developers a range of different uh, things that are particularly important, including the construction guide, which gives you very specifics on how to do a variety of things, including some of the questions that you have there. Um, uh, and then you have a, a variety of issues off of here. So <clears throat> um, let me mention something about uh, permissions. Um, so ultimately, uh, every page that we have on our site has four types of permissions. Uh, uh, so the permission uh, one is public, which basically means everybody and their uncle can see the page. Uh, and it's no problem at all. If you make it private, it means that you only are able to share it with certain people who have permissions for doing so. Semi-private is very similar. Uh, in order to do that. And semi-public is similar to public. And the details of semi uh, are not overly important, but you have the ability in order to dictate uh, the, those, those uh, permissions by looking under restrict access. Because you're basically dictating if you want public, private, or semi-public and semi-private and, uh, and such like that. And you have the ability to give names out. So this gives you an ability in order to work as a team and say, these five people have, uh, uh, are empowered in order to edit the content on the page, but now one else. Uh, so in this case here, only administrators and developers. These are groups that we have put in place. The developers is my developing team. Um, so I have someone in the order of 300 people that have developer access. So they're able to access all the pages out there. Uh, but other than that, no one else can see this. What this means is that when you remix a page, it's stored in uh, your sandbox. Uh, which is available right here once you log in uh, and you make your sandbox and your sandbox is private. So it gives you the ability, in this case here, I have lots of junk in my sandbox because I've been storing it, for, uh, collecting for a decade, but it's the ability in order to just basically have your own den of content to build and to make it and you don't need to worry about other people seeing it. And that's why it has that semi-private uh, 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 aspect on there. 
um, for it. Um, so, Sirisha, yes, uh, if you go to register.leverdix.org, you can request an instructor account. Uh, we just ask for some verification uh, for um, uh, that you're an instructor in order to be able to enable that. Um, things are pretty well protected so that even if you, uh, uh, instructor accounts are given to non-instructors, they don't really have the ability to step on things. You don't have the ability to edit content in other people's sandboxes or other people's uh, bookshelves or other or even the central repository. Um, uh, but you will have the ability to build your books. And then when we move the books to the hub, you can then continually updating and editing them. So you have very selective permissionings. And that's meant in order to ensure fidelity of the content uh, so that people don't step on other people's books and cause issues. And we had that uh, happen several years ago before we implemented the system. So, um, and, and again, there's a lot more details involved in this thing. We do have a Liberfest, which is our, uh, 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 our uh, workshop uh, that we have for the site. So basically I'm giving only a two hour blurb here, um, but if anyone's interested in staying up overnight uh, for three days uh, for you, uh, you can register and the deadline is tomorrow uh, for uh, the uh, labor fest that's uh, going on on the 19th, the 21st and the 23rd of this month. Um, and then you can get uh, uh, up to 15 hours of experience uh, dealing with a variety, wide variety of different features uh, as you master the Libra text and use it effectively uh, that, that's out there. <clears throat> Again, I put the um, blog entry that's right there um, uh, that describes this and the registration uh, information uh, in the, the chat. Okay, so let me talk about homework. And I have, correct me if I'm wrong, I have 15 minutes, right? Yes. Okay. So let me um, let me go and, and do this in a slightly different fashion than the time that I have allocated to it. So it was clear to us for a long time that we wanted and needed to have a homework system to accompany the textbooks that we had created or content that we had harvested into our site. Um, and we had a range of other tech, a range of different technologies that we were able to, to uh, rely on in order to be able to be a homework system. That homework system we have constructed over the last year is called ADAPT. And ADAPT is not relying on one, any one specific technology, but actually relying on multiple technologies, or at least allowing people, faculty, in order to use multiple technologies interchangeably. Um, so we actually have three technologies that are currently set up in order to be used uh, effectively uh, in uh, the ADAPT homework system. Uh, one is called WebWork. Um, which is one of the oldest uh, online homework systems uh, generated, started back in 1995, back when the web was very, very new. Um, and it's based primarily on math uh, and it's algorithmic and it's exceedingly powerful in order to operate. Um, <coughs> IMath AS has a, has a port from, I, uh, from web work, uh, which has a uh, similar capabilities uh, and utility. It's the same technology that underlies uh, my open math which is a, uh, a site um, in the States. Uh, and I think it's used uh, internationally, uh, primarily for math. Uh, it also underlies Lumen Learning's OHM system. Um, uh, and it is also similar math oriented, but the benefits of the math uh, uh, structure is that it gives you a lot of capabilities in order to build any sort of very powerful questioning. Uh, that you may need to capitalize on algorithmic or other aspects uh, that are empowered. The last technology that we have is H5P. H5P is significantly easier in order to operate uh, and significantly easier in order to build questions. However, uh, it's also of, of significantly lower utility. Uh, its power is much, much uh, more uh, reduced than the other platforms that are right there. Um, uh, but it's very powerful in order to be able to uh, embed uh, questions uh, and use them effectively. So uh, let me uh, show you uh, the Libra Studio. Um, and and I'm, gonna, I'm intentionally using the H5P to start with before uh, showing you some of the other things uh, that are there. Uh, one second here. Uh,
Okay. Uh, so um, if you go to studio.libertex.org, this is our repository of H5P prompts uh, that we uh, are, are, are put together. Um, Bob is correct. The normal instruct uh, people can't see other people's sandboxes. Uh, so anyways, so this is a, a set of H5P problems. We have about uh, 280 uh, or uh, two, 2.8 thousand problems uh, and it's growing quite rapidly. People who have created H5P problems. Again, this is one of the three technologies underlying our, our summative things, but it's very easy in order to be able to formulate these things <clears throat> and start to uh, be able to bring them together. For example, uh, let's go to chemistry um, and we're still building this new platform, we had a different one. So these are some questions that were created by Bob Belford, who's here, um, and for example, has a question dealing with periodic, um, actually, let me grab a different one. I want one that has a little bit different uh, things. So this is a, a H5P problem. Uh, this is an open source problem, um, an open, um, Ended problem requiring a human to edit. Uh, I'm trying to find. Okay, so here's a very simple algorithmic problem that you have here. Here's a number, and you're asking what is it converting into calories uh, or kilocalories? I, I presume this is calories. Uh, so you plug in the number when you go through the conversion, which I'm sure that that number is not correct, and you automatically submit it, uh, and it gives you the answer, uh, or it tells you whether you want to retry it or you want to sh uh, show the correct answer. <clears throat> um, that's a very simplistic uh, utility of H5P because it's very simple in order to be able to implement. You can embed these questions directly into your book formatively. Uh, so if you go about doing that, uh, your book then becomes uh, more than just a textbook, becomes a workbook uh, of sorts. So let's say that you, um, I'm going to go to a book that does that uh, in nutrition, just because I know that off the top of my head. Um, uh, that's there. So I go to Lynchfield's uh, uh, intermediate uh, nutrition book, uh, and he has embedded his questions, um, uh, H5P questions into his book so that you can actually see them right here. Um, uh, that's embedded right uh, there. Um, that's, that's there. So you're able to, as a student, start to interact and get the answers that's, uh, that's involved in there. Give me a few minutes, please. Um, so, uh, so you can see all these interactions that are uh, involved in his book right here. And you also see there are a few of the additional features like this glossary that you can put in and such like that. Um, and that's formative, which means that anyone can access this page and start to interact with it. Um, and it doesn't get coupled to a grade book. If you want to couple it to a grade book, we use the ADAPT homework system, which is an intermediary, in order to take the question from a, a repository like uh, this Libre Studio, store it in the uh, uh, store it in our site, and I'm going to switch over to uh, uh, Brian's uh, book. And this is his book, and he has a second version of his book that the questions are all summative, which basically means that students in his class have to sign in, and when they sign in, then they get the same questions, but their questions are, uh, the answers to the questions or their, whether they got them right or wrong, are coupled to the, um, uh, to the grade book. Uh, so, for example, I'm not sure. This is the, the, the book again, uh, <clears throat> and this now says adapt, which means it goes through adapt and then it's summative, it's summative which means it's stored. In contrast, and I already uh, moved it over, the formative says it's query. So you have the ability in order to embed these books directly in here. Uh, in this case here, because I'm logged in as a student, as a uh, uh, as Brian, actually, I'm able to see the scores on how students are performing on that specific uh, question uh, uh, and, and such. Um, so I'd have to long it as a student in order to be able to see what it looks like uh, off of there. The key point is that the same question that we have here can be used formatively and summatively in your textbook uh, using this ADAPT homework system that we have put in place. So the, uh, the same thing applies for the other technologies, uh, but they have a, a bit more complexity because they are more powerful technologies in order to use. And I can show you a few examples of that. So this right here is a, a standard textbook that we would have, or sorry, a standard uh, homework 
course that we would have uh, 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 when you log in to adapt. So uh, in this case here, when you log in to adapt, you make a course or a collection. Um, your course has a series of assignments and each assignment has a series of assessments. So it's a three level system and it's meant to be relatively simplistic. Off the first level is the course, which is um, a foundational nutrition or I'm not sure what F and DH stands for, but it's inter uh, uh, intermediate nutrition. Here are all the assignments that are there. So if you go to assignment seven, it then has, uh, has 22 assessments and each assessment then has a, a specific question that has been used for their, uh, uh, that, that's put in place. Again, this is on ADAPT. The actual question is stored on our Lever Studio um, uh, uh, right here. Uh, in this case here, all the students got it 100% correct uh, when they, uh, they do it. And you can cycle through in order to see every question that is in this assignment and you can put it down there. H5P is convenient with a lot of graphical interface. It's really quite pretty when you move things around. However, from an accessibility argument, many of those questions are, uh, or question types are not uh, useful uh, in areas that are uh, structured in order to make sure that, that people follow appropriate accessibility um, <clears throat> off of that. So anyways, um, that is a, a typical use case. So we can embed into a book. We can also make it so students can actually interact directly with the resource um, uh, as a standalone book. Uh, uh, so that uh, uh, I don't really have an example. So I'm going to log in as myself here. So I have a range of other courses and collections that we've been uh, building over a, a while. Um, uh, and uh, so, for example, let's say we took my uh, my general chemistry class that I taught last uh, spring. Uh, so it has a series of labs and discussions and lecture homeworks and weekly homeworks and exams. So it's a fairly complicated infrastructure. I use ADAPT a bit like how I use my learning management system. In fact, in lieu of my learning management system. Uh, so for example, in this homework that I'm going to be showing you, uh, actually, I can give you an exam. So I gave you past exams, which uh, is perfectly fine. This passes exam has a series of multiple choice, short answer, long answer. Um, uh, it, it's a mixture in this case here of open-ended questions, which I can grade by human, uh, but there's also a series, actually, let me switch to something that's been converted automatically to all technology. Um, uh, so let's grab a, a, a homework, like homework seven. So uh, in homework seven, I don't use H5P for my class. I use WebWork as a technology. Um, and uh, here is it bound into my system. Um, <clears throat> so in this case here, this is a very simple set of data asking what the half-life is uh, to get the people, in, the students in order to identify how to recognize a half-life associated with characteristic data uh, off of that. Um, they give the number uh, that's put into here, uh, whatever it happens to be. They submit the answer and it, it is able to evaluate this. Again, this is web work, so it's stored somewhere else. But I can see the distribution of students that had this question in my class to recognize that there are students that do have a harder time identifying half-life from, um, from just the raw data with the appropriate statistics. Uh, I can then share the solution, uh, which I make a PDF that tells them how to step it along uh, when I want to go about doing that uh, and such. So this is a, a simplified uh, system. I'm not sure why that's not pulling up. I'm having some problems rendering some problems. Um, and then you have um, you know additional questions off here. Something happened. We've been playing around a lot this summer, so we need to dust off some stuff. Um, uh, uh, so in this case here, students will go directly in and log it in um, and access the homework uh, via the ADAPT homework system directly. The last uh, use case we have is we can take these questions and click, use them as clickers uh, so that we can actually hand them out to students and they can pull up their phone um, and ideally have an application, although we haven't uh, built that yet, uh, in order to make it so they can interface with it all or they can do it uh, also with the web. Uh, in order to be able to process that. Um, let me end this, and this is available for everybody. We, we're, we have been 
uh, since the technology was constructed uh, over the last year, we've been started to uh, take all the questions that we have collected uh, in, in our harvesting or that we have built uh, internally and start to put them into here as collections. So you can basically say, for example, if you use the OpenStax chemistry book uh, that's on our platform, you then have access to um, you know, uh, chapter 12, and you have access to all the questions that are connected to that uh, the, that uh, collection that's there. Um, and I'm not sure if this is still open-ended. This one here hasn't been converted or we haven't changed it over off it because it's a slow process in order for us to be able to uh, put that in place. <clears throat> um, and you can see a range of other ones that are put in there. The, the intent is to, uh, including some inorganic analytical chemistry, physical chemistry, and such. So we're trying to be as comprehensive as possible. And I have a team of about 15 undergraduate students that are just plowing through in order to augment these things, in order to be as useful to people as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, the last thing I'll mention uh, about the ADAPT homework system is the reason why it's called ADAPT. So the reason it's called ADAPT is not because of the flexibility and the different technologies that we have available. It's called ADAPT because it has the capabilities in order to deliver uh, adaptive learning. So not just a single question, but to provide a learning tree uh, off of here. So here's an example of a learning tree. Uh, um, um, so that instead of giving an individual question to the student, you can give an individual question tree, which consists of, for example, here's a root question, the student accesses it, if they're wrong, they can then have the option to go into the tree, and they, for example, might get an easier problem that gives uh, uh, remediation or some tutoring help, maybe a video, maybe a more advanced problem, a different learning objective. Maybe they need to master some math that they don't have to do, so you can bring in some math uh, aspects. And you can build this in, uh, into a um, virtual tutor of sorts in order to provide a far more augmented educational experience to students out there. Uh, so we don't have this thing set up with uh, a smart AI, uh, artificial intelligence to do that. Right now it's a choose your own adventure story uh, for the students in order to guide themselves along this tree in order to be able to learn. But there's lots of evidence out there that this is fundamentally far more powerful than just a single question, more traditional based homework system. Uh, at the, uh, I have a team working in Southern California uh, in order to build 81 uh, learning trees for general chemistry um, so they can actually start to use them this upcoming year uh, in lieu of their homework, uh, conventional homework platform. And then we're going to be able to evaluate just how much better it happens to be for uh, instructing students that are out there. This technology is available for anyone in any field, uh, but chemistry is what we're focusing on to begin with because that's where most of our expertise happens to be uh, constructed. So um, there are a handful of other aspects associated with that that I would love to be able to chat with, but I don't have a great deal of time. Um, I think I have only two minutes left. Uh, so uh, with that, I can close this thing off. I can answer any questions that people may have. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity in order to present what we've done. We're very happy with what we've constructed over the last uh, a few years, uh, thanks in part to the support of uh, uh, the, the supporting um, the, the, the funding agencies that, that I, I mentioned at the start of my presentation um, and to the various community members that contribute um, and help us to build what we're doing. If any of this is a particular interest for you guys, uh, I would love to engage in a conversation. Um, uh, uh, my email is domar at libretix.org, which I'll type into uh, the chat. Um, uh, and if you have any content that you'd like to dedicate that is uh, uh, that is openly licensed uh, without any legal implications. My harvesting team has no problem in order to facilitate that. Um, and, and we have uh, um, office hours Tuesday and Thursday mornings, Pacific time, uh, Pacific American time, uh, LA time, um, uh, that, that anyone can jump in for an hour in order to answer any questions. And we're very much enthusiastic in order to get uh, what we've created uh, out to as many people as possible. With that, thank you very much. And there's my email address um, uh, if anyone has an interest in order to contact me. Does anyone have any questions?
I think you have answered most of the questions which were in the chat box. Even Dr. Belford was answering. Thank you for that. Right. Tanas, you can take over. Thank you, Dr. Sir, can I request you to stop screen share? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that lovely session. We are privileged to have our uh, principal with us. So can I request our principal, uh, Dr. Sister Ananda Amrit Mahal, to please address the gathering, Sister. Uh, I feel I'm addressing. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I was unfortunately only able to join at the tail end for the last half hour I've been here, Dr. Larson. And I just want to say that the entire the entire OER platform and the LibreText platform is something so exciting and so very challenging in the use, the correct use of it, but also so exciting in the sense of the possibilities it makes available to so many students that I really can only say thank you so much, A, for dreaming of this and B, for sharing these insights with us. Thank you so much for all the time you've taken. I know it must be what, middle of the night on this by now for you, but uh, it's been really a privilege and a pleasure for all of us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Dr. Shetty, for organizing. Thank you. This is really good. Thank you, sister. Thank you, sister, for your kind words. Uh, participants are requested to fill up the feedback link, which is in the chat box. And I now request Sister Rajini Khandagle to propose the official vote. Thanks. Over to you, Sister Rajini. Thank you, Dhanaz, ma'am. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be uh, giving this vote of thanks on behalf of Sophia College, Department of Chemistry. Uh, our uh, HOD, uh, Dr. Prabhashetti, and uh, all of my colleagues and participants, uh, Professor Delma and Professor Belford, a uh, very big thank you to you, very especially as Sister Ananda said that this is not the time, uh, daytime for you all. You all have already worked a uh, whole day's job you have done and made this time for us. It makes us feel special that uh, you gave this precious time to us. So we are grateful about that. And it has been a really very fascinating, informative and educative um, session, as many of our participants also com uh, commented in the chat box. Um, it, 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 it has opened up a whole new world of uh, textbook for us. I think uh, your whole effort of this liberal text has changed the concept of textbook, uh, not only for uh, educators, but uh, for students. I remember as a student, textbooks were not very attractive and something that we were looking forward to for reference and uh, uh, preparing notes or preparing for exam as such. But, uh, through your session, I realized the, uh, the world of textbook has become much more uh, impressive, much more interactive and attractive uh, for us as educators and for students also. Uh, another thing I really want to appreciate about your whole mission of liberal text is that you are also considering students who won't have access to internet that i really felt was very very impressive internet free liberal text so uh, you all are fired with this mission and you have shared some of that zeal with us uh, we thank you for that we wish you all the best and we look forward to being in some way or the other in collaboration and also using liberal text as we are thank you thank you very much Thank you, Sister Rajni. With this, we officially close the webinar. Thank you, participants, for joining.